What are expectations for Lamar Jackson for the 2022 season? We talk about that and more next year on Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And we return here with another episode of Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostreicher of Ravens Wire. Of course, we're here on the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked on Ravens your first listen of the day. We're free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube. And today's episode of Locked on Ravens is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is we covered this season with more props, odds, and lies than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And we're back another week of Ravens talking as I keep saying every Monday we're, we are really getting closer and closer to training camp. I know it feels like the, the dead of summer right now. There's not really a ton going on. No huge signings or, or trades or anything. Still some news, but nothing super, super huge in regards to the Ravens in a, a few weeks now. All things considered, not necessarily a signing or trade or anything. So just waiting for training camp. We're almost there. So just hang in there, <laughs> hang in there. And I know you can do it, but. Here today, we're still going to talk Ravens, you know, five days a week here, of course. And in the first segment, I do want to get into Derek Wolf and Earl Thomas. Some salary cap numbers reported, and I did want to dive into those a little bit and just talk about what that means for the team, the Ravens salary cap space, etc. In the second segment, though, I do want to dive into expectations, predictions, etc. surrounding Lamar Jackson for 2022. I know kind of a topic that it is a bit popular, at least for me, that I want to kind of talk about because for a player like Jackson, obviously didn't have the end of the 2021 season that a lot of people wanted him to. And I think diving into what he could do in 2022 with better health, better offensive line, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's big. So we'll talk about that in the second segment. Then in the final segment, we'll dive into the second part of positional previews for the Ravens. And we did quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers last week. This week, it'll be tight ends, interior offensive linemen, so centers and guards, and then exterior offensive linemen, I guess, in the offensive tackles. So that'll be this week. And then we'll dive into next week, defensive line, outside linebacker, inside linebacker. And then we'll talk about cornerback safeties and specialists in the last part of the series. So let's talk about all that here today, though. But if you're here with us on YouTube, thank you so much for watching here. You see my face and my background and everything. Thank you so much for subscribing. If you have already, we're Upwards of 2,000. Our next goal is 3,000. So if you haven't subscribed already, you're thinking about it. Maybe this is your first time or your second time, maybe fifth, sixth, whatever time it is. If you haven't subscribed yet, why should you? Well, we have five days a week of Ravens content here, Monday through Friday. So if you want Ravens news, opinions, analysis on everything relating to this team, be sure to subscribe to the channel, like this video, and be sure to follow us in audio form as well. If you hear this in audio form, thank you so much for listening, whether it's on your way to work or from work or wherever, however you're listening. Thank you, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or there, anywhere you get your favorite podcasts. So be sure to follow along, turn notifications on as well. And also be sure to follow me on Twitter at KOSTRACKER34 and the Locked on Ravens account at Locked on Ravens. Let's dive into this content here for today's show. And let's start off with Derek Wolf and Earl Thomas. Now, it was reported by Brian McFarland of Russell Street Report, somebody who is well known for a salary cap take, someone who understands the salary cap relating to the Ravens. He did say, that there were two pieces of Ravens cap info. One, Derek Wolf's injury settlement was $1.2 million, so the Ravens saved $800,000 in cap there. And Earl Thomas and the Ravens settled their grievance for $1.5 million, so that would be deducted from the Ravens cap. This got the retweet from Jess Rebick, so I think it has some, it has a shred of relevance here, I'd say. You know, Jess Rebick, very credible, writer, reporter from The Athletic. So I would say, you know, with that retweet, I give this credit here for, to Brian McFarland for this. And he also says, with these matters now settled, the Ravens currently have Three million two hundred seventy-seven thousand two hundred and forty in cap space. That's enough to get their remaining three draft picks signed, but not much else. They will still have to reach an extension or restructure to create space for future expenses, such as injured reserve, has been able to perform list, practice squad signings, etc. So it's kind of like a mini trip down memory lane here for Derek Wolf and Earl Thomas. We've talked about Derek Wolf a lot. 
we talked about him a lot over the last couple of weeks, obviously with his second hip surgery, didn't play at all in 2021 after a very, very good 2020 season. That That's the, the similarity, I think, with both Earl Thomas and Derek Wolf is both players on the field. Really, really good for the Ravens. Earl Thomas, I know a lot of people remember the off-field stuff, and, and look, rightfully so, right? That, that, that was a big part of everything. But on the field, Earl Thomas was really good. Opposing quarterbacks just did not target his side of the field, had a very low passer rating, completion percentage, et cetera, when targeting Earl Thomas. And again, it, it barely happened. He was that deep safety that the Ravens needed at the time and played really well in that role. I'm, I'm not going to discredit his on-field play. Off of the field, though, it just it wasn't a fit for Earl Thomas somebody who had multiple run-ins with the team and obviously some law issues as well. And the arrest that he had, and also a a recent arrest. He had a recent arrest a couple months ago, I believe. Maybe it was a month ago, a couple months ago, but still having run-ins with the law today. The the tipping point was during training camp, I believe it was, he ended up punching Chuck Clark in practice after I think there was a miscommunication. And there was film of it, actually, that, that got out so you could see it happen. And it just, it was not a good situation all around. It felt like a signing that, so the the rumors and reports, and, you know, again, I'm not reporting this myself. This is just stuff that has floated out on the internet before. Is that Earl Thomas was ready to sign with the Chiefs. That's that's the age old story, apparently. And then the Ravens came and offered him a huge four-year contract. He turned around and signed with the Ravens. And this was around the time Moto Beckham got acquired. So, you know, people connected the dots there. And, you know, there are some, People who believe, oh, this was a this was a decision based around Odo Beckham. But whatever it was, the fit just never really seemed right from the beginning. And while on the field, it was awesome, right? He he played well. Outside of the, I know the Derrick Henry stiff arm moment and a couple of effort plays where I know he and Brandon Williams got into it about the effort on that Nick Chubb run. It, there, it was just again like stacking thing on top of thing on top of thing. He was good on the field. Off the field, though, it wasn't going to fit. And it just seemed like his personality didn't really fit in with the rest of the Ravens culture. And that's how that story ended. So after the Ravens ended up cutting Earl Thomas for contract conduct, excuse me, detrimental to the team, he ended up filing a grievance against the Ravens for $10 million. The Ravens end up settling that grievance with Thomas, apparently here from Brian McFarland for $1.5 million. So plus the 800,000 in cap. That's what Brian McFarland said here. That gives them around 700,000 in cap space to work with. Off the, or that counts against them not to work with. They lose about 700K in cap space because it's obviously the 800,000 they gain and the 1.5 million that they lose. So look, you know, if that's the price they had to pay to get that grievance off the books, kind of just settle it and move on, fine. Yeah, that's fine. Just get it, get it away and, and, and you know, never talk about it again. We'll probably still talk about it sometimes, but I'm glad that reportedly here, this is all done, all said and done, because I know it was something a lot of fans are run- were wondering, you know, it's, it's been a little while since Earl Thomas had been with the Ravens. He had been on the field for the Ravens, right? So glad that situation is over. And for Derek Wolf, the injury settlement is something that, again, a lot of people were wondering with the second hip surgery, will Derek Wolf one, be able to play in 2022 Two. What what's the deal, right? Why was he carrying a, a bear? <laughs> we talked about that with Kadri Ismael and Bobby Trossett brought light to that on his Twitter account. So I know that there was a lot of there are a lot of question marks surrounding Derek Wolf, and, and I get it, right? I mean, a player that was so key for them in 2020, missing the whole year in 2021. People were excited to get him back on the field, and then all of a sudden, you just it's mysterious thing after mysterious thing. Even during the season, he remember he was actually taken off. Well, not taken off, but. He ended up being designated to return from injured reserve, and then he ended up not even returning. John Harbaugh said, yeah, you know what? He's just he's going to miss the rest of the season. So it was kind of a little fishy there. So those two situations, one a little mysterious than the other, another one just more of, all right, when is it going to be over? Come on, let's just, let's, just, let's just get it over with. And now both are seemingly, seemingly done. We don't have to talk about them anymore. They're not hindrances to the Ravens anymore and that's a good thing the Ravens do incur that 700,000 salary cap loss according to Brian McFarland's numbers here but again the the price that you got to pay for the injury settlement for Wolf to open up another roster spot so you're not necessarily putting a guy in injured reserve having to pay that money because the Ravens wouldn't have saved anything if they were to outright release Derek Wolf they would have had to trade him and what team would be taking on a 30 plus defensive lineman with two hip surgeries recently right it just didn't really seem like anything was going to come of it outside of potentially an injury settlement. So I'm glad that's what ended up happening. And then for Earl Thomas, just a situation that went on for a very long time. And I'm, I'm very glad that's over with. So Baltimore, again, according to Brian McFarland here, 
3.2, around $3.2 million in cap space, 3.3. So you can sign the remaining draft picks with that money. And then maybe we'll see extensions, restructures, you know, other maneuvering so that if the Ravens do want to bring in a guy outside of the organization, maybe a cap casualty or bringing in somebody else on the free agent market, they can do that. But for now, uh, I guess the big news of the weekend was the reported Earl Thomas grievance being settled and the Derek Wolf salary cap, at least injury settlement salary cap numbers being revealed there. But we still have a ton coming up here on Locked on Ravens. We're going to dive into Lamar Jackson, a pretty big player on the Ravens. Lamar Jackson's expectations for this year, in my opinion, what I expect from him and just all the, the hype surrounding him, what comes of that as well, and a lot more too. So be sure to stay tuned. Still a ton to talk about here on Locked on Ravens. First though, I do want to tell you a bit about Bet Online. Bet Online is the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news including this year's NHL playoffs and Major League Baseball. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. That's the website today. Use your motivation to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online, where the game starts. We're back. Our second segment of Locked On Ravens, Kevin Ostriker, your host, still here with you. And now we're going to dive in to Lamar Jackson and his expectations for this season. Now, Jackson, polarizing player in so many different aspects. He's a guy who can obviously throw the football exceptionally well, has that dual threat ability as a runner that just makes him so unique and so amazing as a talent. And because of that, because of the success that he's had in prior years, because of the potential that he has shown and the ceiling that he's shown that he has, there is so much expected of him. And look, rightfully so. He's shown that he can do it. He's won in big situations. And I think that for the Ravens, he's somebody who, I don't know, you you look at him and and you just think there's so much more. There's so much more that he can accomplish at this level. And I know the 2019 MVP season something that will be in the history books forever, that team, that 14-2 and two team. But, you know, again, it's hard for any player to replicate that MVP success. So in 2020, people classified it as a down year because he didn't have the stats like his 2019 MVP season, where we did see areas of improvement from him in 2020. So again, I think if... If Lamar Jackson was to replicate and improve on that MVP season every single season, he'd be throwing for 70 touchdowns and rushing for 3,000 yards, right? All all this different stuff. There will be some statistical regression, but that doesn't mean he's getting worse. And I think that's what some people thought when they didn't see the touchdown numbers or the, you know, the interception, whatever it may be. That's what people thought when it's, oh, he doesn't have the stats he had in 2019 and this year. So he's obviously worse. That's not what it was. So when talking about Lamar Jackson, let's let's just look at his 2021 season first here. So in 2021, obviously not the season he he envisioned for himself, I'm sure. He went seven to five as a starter, ended up throwing for 2,882 yards, 16 touchdowns, and 13 interceptions. Also ran for 2,800, or no, that's not right. <laughs> also ran for 767 yards on 133 attempts and had two touchdowns on the ground. So average 5.8 yards per attempt on the ground and then uh, through the air ended up throwing for 7.5 yards per attempt as average air yards per or adjusted yards gain per pass attempt was 6.9. So Jackson's a player, almost 10,000 yards passing. He has <laughs> another unbelievable number with 3,673 yards rushing over the course of his four years in this league. So he, he's a player that you look at his career numbers. It's great. But in 2021, I do think that first half of the season, we saw some great things from him as a passer. Right. I think that a lot was lost because of the second half of the year. People saw the Miami game. People saw the second half of the season going down with the injury in week 14. Some of the struggles he had prior to that injury in the second half of the year past the Miami game. And that's what people look at and they say, well, he didn't have a good year. And it was this, that and the other. Yes, the overall year for Jackson was not what I think people expected of him. The second half of the year was not great for Jackson. Right. I can admit that a lot of people can admit that. But the first half of the season, we saw him putting up numbers. And when the offensive line wasn't in complete shambles, when he was able to throw from the pocket, he's able to work from the pocket. He's able to be a successful pocket passer in this league, which some people just, I mean, they they don't give him credit for it. And and I don't, I don't understand it. Like, is he, is he perfect in the pocket? No, but it seems like, again, every mistake from the more Jackson is amplified in terms of, whether he throws a perfect ball or this ball's a bit off target, you see other quarterback 
let's get away with that kind of stuff a little bit, right? It's like, oh, well, it's the receiver's fault, or you'll go get them next time with Lamar Jackson. It's all, oh, it's all your fault, Lamar. Like, that's all, it's all you. Be better. So, I, I don't know. It's all this different stuff goes into it. But I think what we saw, again, I go back to the Colts game. That's a game where he ended up just having a monster second half in overtime. Mark Andrews, that was his come to life game. And we saw him in the Raiders game. You talk about him in the Chargers game. I mean, there are so many instances during that first half of the season where I thought the passing offense looked better and something that I expected going into the year was an improved passing offense. And, and that's what we got over the first part of the season. I was impressed with some of the stuff that Greg Roman did there as well. Second half of the season, pretty different story. The passing offense regressed tremendously and it, it just wasn't good. Jackson, the decision-making, there were some decisions that I think were fueled by poor offensive line play others that, you know, he, he was at fault for. So you look at that, but my expectations for him, obviously fully healthy to start the season. At least you'd, you'd hope so. I think he is. He has his, hopefully his players coming back. Hopefully JK Dobbins, Gus Edwards, Ronnie Stanley, you look at defense, Marcus Peters, Nick Boyle on offense as well, fully back and healthy for week one. That's what the hope is. Now, is that going to happen? We don't know yet, but assuming they're able to come back in the first six weeks of the year, those will all be upgrades. You you lose Marquise Brown, so that does hurt the offense a little bit, but you're relying on Rashad Bateman. You're relying on James Prochet, Devin Duvernay, Tyler Wallace. So still talent there, a bit unproven, but I think that you have, with Mark Andrews still there, it's a little bit more okay than it would have been if you just had, a random tight end in there and, and like an average guy, Mark Andrews, uh, as I talked about last week, a top two tight end in my book. So I, I will certainly take that, but this was an off season for Lamar Jackson to again, kind of toil in, in, in the, the happenings of last season and understand, Hey, this is what I didn't do well last year. Let's figure it out. He's been working all off season. Didn't show up to voluntary OTAs. That's all right. He, he was still working during that time. He's, put in time with his teammates. He's been, again, just this super hard worker all off season came in a mandatory mini camp. And, you know, he, he talked about you know, the stuff that he did during the off season. He talked about his desire to win. He's a very competitive player that I think will fuel him overall. So when talking about what I expect of him, the Ravens play a fourth place schedule. You can never count on any team in the NFL, right? I'm not saying, Oh, well, the Ravens play a fourth place schedule. They're going 17 and 0. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But I think with, what Lamar Jackson showed towards the second half of the season, you know, a bit of the decision-making stuff and maybe throwing when he should have been running, running when he should have been throwing the throwing out of bounds and, and, you know, should have been throwing out of bounds and instead was getting sacked or making these bad throws. I think that goes away with improved offensive line play for the most part, right? He'll still, there, there will still be poor decisions. Every quarterback makes poor decisions. It's not just Lamar Jackson. There are still some things where you're saying, Oh, why would you throw that? This, that, and the other, every, quarterback goes through that the best of the best Lamar Jackson's up there but the best of the best go through that so I think the decision making will be a lot better this year from him from what we saw in the second half of the season last year expectations from him I think we will start to see the deep ball continue to progress from him when Jackson went out Tyler Huntley you know could not throw a deep ball for anything right it was I think he had one deep ball completion of more than 20 yards. Maybe I'm wrong there. I'm not exactly sure, but the deep ball was not clicking. Lamar Jackson, I believe, had the second highest adjusted errors per attempt in the league last year, only behind, I believe it was Russell Wilson. Don't quote me, but I believe it was Russell Wilson. And that that showed the Ravens were taking deep shots, and I think they want to continue to add that to their offense. Now, without Marquise Brown, it'll be interesting to see how they actually do all that. But again, it's going to be Jackson relying on guys like Devin DuVernay as a speedster. Maybe they bring in somebody who knows. But I expect Jackson to be a lot sharper this year. Not that he hasn't been before, but, you know, just the improvements, right? Every year there's an opportunity for players to improve, hone some of their skills. And that's what I'm expecting. You know, there are big expectations for Lamar Jackson. And as I said at the beginning of the segment, rightfully so. He's a talented player. He's somebody who a lot of people believe in to continue to ascend and ascend and ascend and ascend. And I think for a player that, again, didn't have the year that he wanted in 2021, obviously, the 2,882 passing yards through the most interceptions of his career, you know, and in terms of like comparisons in 2020, he threw 376 passes, had nine interceptions in 2021 through 382 passes, had 13 interceptions. And the touchdown percentage compared to 2020 was 6.9%. In 2021, it was 4.2%. Look, a lot of some of this had to do with injuries, right? I'm not blaming it all on injuries, but I'm also not blaming none of it on injuries. So there's a lot that that goes into it projection wise in terms of, you know, stats, if you want to go numbers. I think 
I think I'd put him probably down for, I'd, I'd call it his second best year of his career. That's what I'm expecting out of him. Maybe not quite the MVP numbers that we saw. Look, 36 touchdowns and, and six interceptions, 9% touchdown percentage. That's just, those are otherworldly numbers. And I'm not saying Jackson can't get back there, but I think that for this year, he's somebody who I think will have more, like let's say 30 touchdowns, maybe 10 interceptions, so right in the thir- 9 to 13 range, like 30 touchdowns, 10 interceptions, throwing. I think the Ravens are going to try to pass the ball more. Like, I think they're – look, Jackson ended up throwing a, a lot more passes than he did, and I know that it, it's the, it's a game thing. He only played – or he played in 15 games in 2020, only 12 in 2021. So he ended up throwing more passes in 2021 in 12 games than he did in 2020 with 15. But I think the Ravens will try to pass the ball more, balance out their offense while still being that run-heavy team. I think that, that will be what they go back to. I'd put Jackson probably in the, I don't know, he, he threw 400 passes in 2019. I think he, he, he might throw the most attempts he has in his career this year. I think he might end up being 420, 450. Maybe that's on the high end a little bit, but I could see that. I could see that be impossible. And I think rushing wise, I think that'll still be a big part of his game. I think he'll, I, I think he'll go over a thousand yards, maybe, maybe barely like he, Ended up rushing for 1,005 in 2020. I'll say maybe like 1,050, 1,070 in 2022 here. Maybe he'll have six touchdowns, five touchdowns on the ground. So a player with 35 total touchdowns, I think that, again, puts him in the MVP conversation, maybe not at the very top of it, but I think that puts him at least back in the, hey, this is a for sure bounce back year for him, which I expect. And I know bounce back is, again, comparing what you saw in the first half of 2021 versus in the second half. So, again, I think he's going to be able to lead this team to the playoffs in a very talented AFC. He's one of those players that, again, makes everybody around him better. And that's what I'm expecting from him. There are a lot of other things to go into expectations. If if, if I talked about every single thing, we'd be here for hours. So, I, I can't touch on every single thing, but we'll talk about it throughout the rest of the offseason. Obviously, we'll bring on guests. We'll talk about it there as well. So those are my expectations for Lamar Jackson. Maybe around, you know, 30 passing touchdowns, maybe 10 interceptions. You got five rushing touchdowns right in that area. And then pure numbers perspectives. I also, from a completion perspective aspect, really quickly, uh, for him, he, he's a player that – Right in the 64, well, actually, 2020 and 2021 had 64.4% both years. So, yeah, let, let's say like 65%, 65.5% completion percentage. But I think that might go up depending on the running back aspect of it, whereas you throw in the running backs a little, checking down a little bit more. So maybe that, that's up to 66, 67 maybe. So I think that will be an aspect to look at as well. But we still have a lot to talk about here on the show. Let me get back. We're going to be diving into a positional preview of tight ends offensive linemen, both interior and exterior. So be sure to stay tuned. Still a ton to talk about here on the show. First though, I do want to tell you a bit about Rock Auto and this episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. And with the ever increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your luggage and auto parts or to stock all the parts you need. Why and from pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter or is the bars in their computer. Choosing the only brand the warehouse happens to carry will leave from users access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. You can save time and money when using Rock Auto. They're a family business. Their prices are super low and you can explore the easy use website today to find the solution to your auto parts needs so go to rockauto.com right now and see other parts available for your car or truck right locked on there how'd you hear about us box you know we sent you amazing selection of live below prices other parts of car whatever you need rockauto.com we're back our final segment here of locked on ravens kevin all your your host still here with you and again thank you so much for making locked on ravens your first listen of the day be sure to subscribe to us on youtube follow us in audio form be sure to make your second listen locked on nfl where i hosted the monday show we talked to experts around our network about the stories happening throughout the league. So be sure to check that out again, anywhere you get your podcasts and on YouTube as well. But let's talk about the positional preview. Again, we talked about quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers in the first part of this last week, the second part of the series, it'll be tight ends, interior offensive linemen, exterior offensive linemen. So let's start with the tight ends. The tight end position is one that I am very confident in depth wise for them. Obviously Mark Andrews, can't say enough about Mark Andrews, someone who is a top two tight end in my book, as I talked about. Someone who, you know, you can rely on every week to be a stud, to be someone who just creates matchup nightmares all over the place. Then you have Nick Boyle, someone who was really in and out over the course of 2021, suffered that gruesome knee injury in the middle of 2020. Seems to be seems to be fully healthy right now, or at least somewhat back there. So while he might not play a ton of preseason snaps, I think he will be on the field in week one, hopefully, right? 
but he's someone who's one of the best blocking tight ends in the NFL when healthy. Domino, I think, just provides so much to this Baltimore offense when he's on the field, especially when the team does favor that bully ball type type style. So Boyle, someone who is very impressive. And then you have the two rookies in Charlie Kohler and Isaiah Likely, who I think will both make impacts. Their roles might not be super huge, but I expect them to play in a lot of different roles. Isaiah Likely, someone you can line up all over the field. Charlie Kohler ends up projecting a little bit like Mark Andrews, so like a mini Mark on the on the team for Baltimore. Those are the four guys I expect to make the team. Other guys you look at, Josh Oliver, Tony Poyan as well. Two, two guys who I just I don't see ending up making this roster. I mean, maybe maybe practice squad candidates, but I don't see – Oliver would be the, the only other guy I could say, well, if this or that or the other – Maybe they try to sneak him on the practice squad. I don't see him making it to the practice squad. Baltimore gave up a conditional seventh, which ended up conveying because he made the 53-man roster last year. So I think the talent they have at the tight end position with Andrews, Boyle, Kohler, and Likely is completely fine with me. It's a very deep position overall. But speaking of deep positions, the offensive line really is a position that uh, I feel I feel a lot more confident in this time this year than I did this time last year. Interior, let's start there first. So centers and guards, the really only – Pure question mark, I'd say, is left guard. If that's going to be a competition, it feels like between four guys and Patrick McCary, Tyree Phillips, Ben Cleveland, and Ben Powers. If I had to pick who wins it outright, I would say it's a battle probably between McCary and Phillips. I think Cleveland has the potential to win that job, but I just, I don't know. I don't see it this year. Maybe that's a next year thing. Phillips impressed me at guard. You know, I think he's not he's not a perfect player there, but he impressed me with his, his reps there when he was able to play, especially week one against the Raiders. He played well there. But McCarry's somebody who can play all five positions. So you're looking at that and you're saying, well, th- there's something to it. But I would put Phillips there if he has the showing to deserve that spot. I think Patrick McCarry is better as the super sixth offensive lineman. But we could see those McCarry being the number one center heading into training camp. Maybe first official depth chart McCarry has a nod over Linderbaum because of the the veteran status, but I think Linderbaum ends up starting week one. But at that center position, you have Linderbaum, you have McCarry, you have Kristen Cologne. And Cologne at this rate might not make the roster because of the roster crunch of Ravens will probably have to face on the offensive line. Where, you know, you're, you're looking at guys like Ben Bredesen, who I've talked about before, trading him to the Giants because the Ravens knew he wasn't going to make the roster, getting draft capital back, I believe it was better Bredesen and a sixth for a fourth. From the Giants, and that was a huge get for them. So maybe if they have to trade a Ben Powers or a Tristan Cologne, they can get back that capital while knowing that hey, look, this guy's not going to make the roster. Let's at least get something back for him. That would be huge, in my opinion, definitely. And I think right guard's pretty set. Kevin Zeitler's the guy there. I mean, not, not a not a lot of not a lot of competition. Kevin Zeitler, one of the best guards in the NFL last year, and I'm, I loved the signing when it happened. I love him. I love it even more now. So that's kind of where I am with with right guard but yeah offensive tackles the position that i really want to focus on here for offensive line is interior you know they're kind of set of the positions and i'm not saying you're not a tackle but i am impressed with what the ravens did at tackle in terms of depth i am i mean ronnie stanley we saw what happened when the ravens didn't really provide a ton of insurance in case of stanley getting injured again in 2021 or having some setback and of course only starts one game against las vegas and you know we we, we know what happens he ends up not being himself, ends up opting for the second surgery out for the season after one game. Alejandro Villanueva did not play well. He, he didn't play well. Pasha McCary played well at right tackle for the most part, but then got pretty banged up towards the, the end of the year. Tyree Phillips, who they pretty much had to put there, not a tackle. He's he's just not a tackle, unfortunately. I, I love him at guard, but I don't, I don't love him at tackle. So that's where I am there. But what you do if you're the Ravens in that situation is you say, look, we're not going to let that happen again. The Ravens said that, and they went out there and they proved it. They signed Morgan Moses. They brought in Juwan James last off. He's going to miss the season with a torn Achilles. He He's back and seemingly ready to go. You draft Daniel Falele in the second or fourth round. He was se- second round talent, but it got him in the fourth round. And you bring in a bunch of guys who, again, starter ready with Moses and James. You have a project piece in Daniel Falele who I think – has super high upside compared to an Orlando Brown in terms of his size, his his rawness in a couple areas to kind of improve on. But now you have the insurance to say, look, if Ronnie Stanley's not healthy week one, he has to set out a couple more weeks to get that ankle fully right, which I think, again, they should do. I think it should be the 100% mentality where you don't put him out there unless they are truly 100% ready to go instead of 85% or 70%. You can move Patrick McCarry to left tackle where he has played before. You know, he, he can play all five positions. 
You could move Morgan Moses out there and start Jamon James at right tackle. You have Lily in case of an emergency. You have a couple other guys. Tyree Phillips is your like very, 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 very last resort. You don't want to really use that. But you have options. I think you have better options. You have more options. And that's what I'm excited about with this team with the offensive tackle position. Because, again, towards the end of the season, we saw Lamar Jackson running for his life because the tackle spots were just collapsing in on him. Every single play it was pressure, and Lamar Jackson has to run outside and ev- evade the pressure. And he looked, he's one of the best quarterbacks at doing that. But we saw when he was able to just pass in the pocket, be himself in the pocket, go through his reads and his progressions, and actually have time to focus in there. He was throwing dots, throwing lasers, throwing beautiful dimes to people like it's just incredible football. So that's what I want to see from the offensive tackle position a position that has the back of Lamar Jackson, can give him time in that pocket. Because for me, it, it all starts up front. Your quarterback can be amazing. Your running back can be amazing. Wide receivers, tight ends, whatever. If you cannot block, there's going to be a defensive lineman in the backfield every 1.5 seconds. Pass rushers are going to get there. You have to be able to protect. You have to be able to block. I think the Ravens, they, they emphasize that. You know, losing Bradley Bozeman, they bring in Tyler Linderbaum. They saw what happened at tackle last season. They bring in mega reinforcements. So I'm excited to see how that tackle position ends up shaping out because I think it'll be a really, really good one to watch. Definitely. So that was the additional preview for this week. Next week, we'll dive into again, defensive linemen, outside linebackers and inside linebackers. But that's all I have for you here today on Lockdown Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in. When we get back in tomorrow, we'll be diving into more Ravens content. So be sure to stay tuned for that. And I'll see you here tomorrow.